Luke 18. And I'm going to take it from verse 35. Let's read the word of the Lord. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, quote, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? I want you to say that. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Father, thank you for this service tonight. All those online, 86 churches in the Philippines, 60 plus thousand subscribers on YouTube, on Facebook, Spotify, on our web stream, those that'll listen even in the future. We ask that you would mark us tonight with a powerful touch of your spirit. Even as you were passing by the man blind on the road to Jericho, you're passing by tonight. Jesus is passing this way. So may lives be forever altered, each and every one of us, we ask and declare in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, we do have notes for you. I've had a lot of feedback on our Sunday morning service, Sunday night service as well, the KSM commencement, the powerful word, is there not a cause? You want to go and avail yourself to that. It's important to listen to strong preaching and teaching. It's crucial to do it because you feed yourself uh, the word, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, and you can receive impartation. I listen to, I listen to different preachers, favorite ones of mine. My most favorite one is Dr. James Morocco. He's been my pastor and my family's pastor since 1992, and uh, we're so grateful as he is now leading the work in Dallas. And I do believe it's important to listen just not to the preachers and teachers that are in our particular stream. I think there's tremendous preachers and teachers in, in, in every stream. There's people under bridges that can preach and teach better than anybody here. They might not just be saved yet, I don't know. A favorite book of mine by Alan Redpath, and he's a Baptist, is The Making of a Man of God. It's, it's a book that everybody should read. It's the making of man of God, Alan Redpath, powerful. He's a Baptist. It's packed with revelation on the life of David and how God made him into a man of God. It marked my life some 20 years ago. I still go back and read through it from time to time. And the text that I've chosen to preach to you tonight is, is going to be powerful for you. And it's, it's powerful for me as I studied it. And in reference to hearing good preaching and teaching, I'm told that Sunday morning was one of the best messages ever it was ever preached here. I don't know that that's the case. I mean, it'd be like level one through 10 or whatever, but I don't know. I just know that God touched people, touched me. Power, God set people free. I had people weeping, people calling me, people texting and said, my gosh, I was so impacted by that. And uh, that's in a series called Sound Mind. We have two more series, two more messages in the series, and then we're going to move on to another one that'll take us through the 4th of July about America being healed. And I'm looking forward to preaching those messages to you. This is a beautiful passage and an introduction. introduction. What should you do if Jesus passed by? What should you do if he passed by? I mean, if he's walking up and down the aisle, how, how would you respond to that? 
I don't know if you ever reached out for somebody who was famous and wanted their autograph or rushed to the front of, uh, of a stage or something to, to meet with somebody or see if you could talk with somebody. I've done that in many different times. When there's been powerful unctions of the Spirit and move of God, I frequently will find my way up front and weasel my way in there and, and, and get hands laid on me because I understand the principle of transference and impartation. And so when God's, God's touching me in a service and I feel led of the Lord, I'll, I'll go and I'll ask for that. I remember Tommy um, Barnett was preaching in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And as he preached, we had to catch a plane. And we had to get up and leave towards the end right before the altar call. And so Dr. Morocco and I and some of the other pastors that were visiting that church in Baton Rouge were walking out. I said, can we just, can we just wait? Just, we're going to be okay. Can we just wait a minute? He said, yes, we can. And so we're waiting in the back. He starts giving the altar call. I was so wrecked. I looked at pastor. He's like, go on then. And I ran to the front. I was like, came skidding into the front. Tommy's the first one that laid hands on me. And the power of God touched me. I wanted an impartation from Tommy Barnett. It touched my life. Priest, miracle, miracles in the house. He said he'd come up here. We ought to have him come. Did you know that uh, in the Brownsville revival, talking about hungering and thirsting and going after God, in the Brownsville revival, now this is not a racist thing, it's just true, that people that were from Asia understood a little bit better how to get through a crowd. And what they would literally do, you could not get to the front. And what they would do is they'd get on their hands and knees and crawl between people's legs until they found the shoes of the preacher. They would find the shoes and then they'd pop up and go, <laughs> that's hungry. That's thirsty. You're willing to do. Can you imagine having to crawl on your hands and knees until you found the sneakers? Can you imagine that? Jesus is passing this way. Come on, say that. Jesus is passing this way. This blind beggar receives a miracle. He calls out to Jesus. His calling out showed that he believed that Jesus is the Messiah. That phrase, Jesus, son of David, Jesus, son of David, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David is a reference to the the covenant word given to David, King David, that there would never be a descendant that wouldn't be upon the throne. It's a, it's a prophetic declaration. I know you're the Messiah, son of David. There's only one son of David is the Messiah. So when, so when a Jew is crying out, son of David, we know what he's saying. He's basically being born again on the spot. I mean, that's kind of what's happening. He's acknowledging this is the savior of the world. This is the one who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one who can heal the sick and set the captive free. Son of David, he wanted his eyesight. He wanted the miracle and he cried out cried out, here is the one, Jesus, fulfilling Isaiah 35. The wilderness shall be a wasteland for them, verse 1. The desert shall rejoice, and the blossom, and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing, and the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The excellence of Carmel and Sharon, this shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God, Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful, be strong, do not fear. This is a messianic prophecy. He will come and save you, verse 5, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Now, I don't know that he knew that text, but he knew enough. Having never seen Jesus, never seen a miracle, he knew enough to cry out, Son of David, Son of David, Son of David. He only heard what was happening. Somebody witnessed to him. And he cries for mercy. Have mercy on me. Have mercy. My goodness. The devil wants to put things in your mind. He wants to put things in your heart to get you to think contrary to the word of God. He wants to put things in your mind to, think that, to get you to think that you've gone too far or you ate the salad when you were on the 21-day fast or, or you just, you're just not good enough or you didn't pray enough. or I mean, he'll put all kinds of things in your mind. I'm a woman, I'm a man, I'm black, I'm white. He'll, he'll make all kinds of excuses for you to latch hold of to say that you're not worthy of receiving a miracle. And he cries out, have, have mercy. God wants to help you. 
Come on, say, bump your neighbor and say, he wants to help you. Come on, somebody say, I need some help. I am completely dependent upon the Lord. And the more, I, the more I grow up in him, and I believe I'm beginning to, the more I realize I, I need him. You know, Pastor Vince went to have a procedure on his heart today, went perfectly, doctors pleased, everything's great. He's very aware that he needed his heart to be working rightly, and it had some issues, and he's healed tonight, and they sent him home. You need God. I need God. Without God, you're going to drop dead on the spot. And sometimes we take that for granted. And this, this, this boy didn't have eyesight. And he knew that Jesus has mercy. The son of David had mercy. So God wants to help you. He wants to, he wants to meet your need. I'm telling you tonight that you can have every problem broken off of your mind, broken off of your life, broken off of your physical body. Tonight, Jesus is passing by, and he's going to touch you unless, of course, you miss it. Blind man only heard that Jesus is passing by, and he begins to shout out. He had to persevere. He persevered in crying out. Even when he's rebuked, even when he's rebuked, has anybody been rebuked because you were so passionate, so desperate for God? I have. It's been a while. I remember just crying out to God, and they said, can you just calm down? I, I remember going to a church, not this church, it was another church, and I was getting so touched by God, and I was worshiping, and they said, excuse me, sir. I'm like, yeah, I'm crying. I'm getting touched by the Lord. They're like, you can't raise your hands. I'm like, what? Yeah, if you want to do that, can you go back by the sound booth? I'm like, okay. And I just went back by the sound booth and continued my experience with God. I don't think that church exists anymore. Actually, it does. It does. But when you're hungry and you're thirsty, you don't really give a flip if you look like a fool in the face of your peers in order that you're em embraced in the arms of the master. And there's always going to be said telling, you know, on fire, desperate Christians. It's not cute. It's not cute when you're broken and you're desperate. It's just like, man, I need, I need help. You ever, anybody besides me ever been there? Desperation moves the hand of God. Not crocodile tears, not half-heartedness. And this, this boy was crying out so much, they like, shut up. Persevere, James 1 and 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face all kind of fiery trials. But you can know that because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Perseverance is a character quality of a Spirit-filled believer. It's really a character quality of every believer, not just a spirit-filled one. Persevere. You have to endure. You have to keep fighting. You have, to, you have to keep keeping on. You have to keep crying out. You have to keep, keep believing. Hallelujah. Don't stop believe. All right, I got to say, that doesn't even sound good. Just don't. Everybody say, don't stop. Don't stop. And I love how Jesus says, bring, bring him near. When your desperation is sincere, you will always be embraced. A broken and contrite heart, he will not spurn. He's close to the brokenhearted. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. I have been out of kilter in my life with the Lord before, and that is painful, where you're out of order, where you're out of balance. I remember early on, I was struggling with a man-pleasing spirit many, many years ago, and I got healed of it. But in the process of being healed, I accepted so many responsibilities that I had barely any time to do anything 
for my family, for Pastor Karen. It wasn't good. I, I was, had a Messiah syndrome. Any phone call, anything, any day off, I'd drop anything and go help anybody all the time. Now, don't you do that now? No, I don't. I, I don't. I'll help people, but not at the cost of the detriment of my marriage. We serve hard. We work hard. We're, you know, we're diligent. We believe in that. But you don't do it so to, and to the degree that you destroy your, your family, your kids. They never see you. Come on, that's not good. That, that's not good. God, let me get that. try that one more time. That's not good. All right. So during that course of time, I remember accepting one more responsibility. I could tell you my schedule, but I mean, it was, it was, it was impossible. I mean, it was so stout. And I, I was cracking under the pressure of it. And I remember coming into a staff meeting and I was starting to weep because I didn't know how I was going to make it through the day. And I started weeping. And uh, Dr. Morocco's looking at me. And finally, I just sort of popped right there. I said, hey, doctor. He's like, yes. I said, if his burden is easy and his yoke is light, what's this? <laughs> and he's like, he just kind of looked at me and Pastor Colleen said, Jimmy, which is what she calls him, he needs prayer. They came, they laid hands on me, and I think I left with more work. It also made us stronger, but I had to learn a lot through those times. And if you'll draw near to God, he'll lift that burden off of you. If you'll reach out, and when he, he's, pa if he's passing by tonight, he's, he's here. We know theologically he's here. If he was to ask you, you know, what do you want him to do for you tonight? What would be your response? If he's passing up and down these aisles, would you reach out? What would you do? There's a positioning of faith, a desperation that comes. Are you desperate? Years ago, the Lord said, you need to be desperate for me. I said, well, I'm not feeling all that desperate. He said, I can help you with that. Sometimes I just want to pray, Pastor Gill. Everybody has troubles, so they just come to the Lord. Don't look at me like that. Does anybody remember 9-11? Does anybody remember 9-11, the church received all kinds of phone calls, people calling the church, asking for prayer. That Sunday after 9-11, did anybody go to church the Sunday after 9-11? It was jam-packed. And we saw people return that hadn't been in church in years, months. People were like, they, we just didn't know, we didn't know what was gonna happen. Is this it? Are we gonna be totally invaded now? There's no aircraft in the air. I mean, the Twin Towers had fallen. I mean, is this it? Are we about to be nuked? Talking about suitcase nukes and different things like that. The church was jammed because people were like, oh God, I better serve you right now. Yeah, desperate. The moment of faith comes when Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? Now, I want you to think about that. What do you want me to do for you? If the Lord is to ask you that question, what would you say? I mean, you think it would be obvious. I mean, as a blind man, he had a blind beggar's garment. It would be something, it was almost like a license to beg. That would be part of the culture. So he probably had that garment. He uh, is there talking to Jesus, obviously. Jesus, son of David. I mean, obviously he's blind. We all know he's blind. Do you think Jesus, listen, even if he didn't look blind, Jesus knows everything. Jesus knows he's blind. So he's blind. Why would Jesus ask him, what do you want me to do? Why? What's the obvious answer? Um, I'd like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's not the answer. I want my eyesight. Well, why would he ask him then? Why would he, come on, think about it. Come on, help me out. Why would he ask Jesus, um, why, why would Jesus ask the blind beggar, what do you want me to do for you when he knows full well he's blind? Faith, who was that? Bonus, 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 bonus. I know some of you were thinking it, you get a bonus also. Faith, but I don't really like it. What do you mean you don't like it? Well, I don't really like it because it's very different than what he does at other healings and miracles. He would, he would command, he would spit. 
mix some mud and jam it in someone's eye. He would command healing. He'd speak and people would be healed. This is different. He says, what do you want me to do for you? And he, he says, I want to receive my sight. And he says, your faith has healed you. You know why I don't like that? Because it puts the weight of responsibility of miracles. I mean, I like it and I don't like it. But it puts the weight of responsibility that God's going to move according to my faith. So what, what's my level of faith? Where's your level of faith at? You're believing God to, 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 to do miracles. You're believing God for provision. You're believing God for eyesight. You're believing God for those things. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? He elicits from you, asks of you, what do you want me to do? And he's getting you to articulate and speak, in this case, a blind beggar who everybody knew was blind. I want to receive my sight. And he says, your faith has healed you. Now that's brutal because how many things have happened when, because we didn't have faith? Now I've seen people abuse people with this. Well, that didn't happen because of your faith. Oh, shut it. Don't you ever say that to somebody because you have no idea. You're not God. And don't you ever say that. That's spiritual abuse. Is it true? It's possible. Yes, it is. So then you have to examine it, but look at, look at the, examine your life and then look at the possibility. Well, you mean if you have, if you have faith to contend to ask, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to give me a building in Eagle River. I'd like one in Anchorage and I want this one paid off. I'd also like, uh, uh, what, uh, well, the, the 10% of the population. I want to cover the earth of the glory of the Lord. Oh, I want God to see your power poured out or raise the dead. I mean, what's the level of what your faith is at? I got like a amen from Pastor Karen. Are you guys all right? Could it be that things aren't happening to the degree that it could happen? Yes. Emphatically, yes. And that's the part I don't like it because it makes me have to be responsible for my faith. But on the opposite side, it's a beautiful thing. The possibilities of that are literally limitless. With God, nothing is impossible. Lift your hands to heaven. What do you want me to do for you? The Lord would say. What do you want me to do for you? Come on, shake, shake the lint out of your heart. What do you want me to do for you? What is the 911 for you tonight? You begin to ask him. Because Jesus is passing this way. The statement, receive your sight, for your faith has healed you. Wow. And instantly he's healed, and he follows Jesus, praising God. God is speaking to us. The Lord is speaking to us. Who do you see Jesus to be? There was some dumb movie out a while back. I only saw like a little couple clips, and I... I just this guy that needs a lot of healing, constantly talking about little baby Jesus, little baby Jesus, he's the baby Jesus in the manger, baby Jesus. Well, but he does not a baby Jesus in a manger anymore. He's the conquering king. He's a resurrected Lord. Some people like to keep little baby Jesus in the little manger and keep him as little baby Jesus. How cute. It's cute for Christmas. But if you have a distortion about who God is, if you don't know who he is, now how do you know who he is? You know who he is by his word. So when you learn his words, you get to see who he is. And then you see him moving and you see his fingerprints all over your life and all over, all over, everywhere. He's the creator. You can't look at a flower and realize that he's just not awesome. You look at your own lives. You look at your, your, you look at your fingerprints. My, my, our, our daughter's pregnant. We've got a grandchild on the way. They go to get an MRI, they get, not the MRI, what do they do? The, the sonogram. They go to get a sonogram, and the kid's like, <laughs> nobody knows. No, they take a blood test. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl. They're like, we're going to find out. And the, and, the, and the child's like, no, you ain't. <laughs> and they see this. I've watched this, I watched this precious grandchild of mine swallowing I see the spine and the heartbeat, and I just can't help but laugh. Like, we, I've just watched this video. I know you've watched it a dozen times yourself. I've watched it, and I just watch it going, <laughs> yes. 
It's the hand of God doing this. You can't, if you open your eyes, he's everywhere moving him. Oh, the devil, the devil, the devil. He is, he is created and one day he's going to be uncreated. The omnipotent, awesome, mighty God is everywhere moving in power and the devil's got nothing on him. Come on, come on, slap the person five next to you. I didn't say slap them. I said slap them five. Come on, you're created by God. All our, our irises are different. Our fingerprints are different. We're all unique. We're all designed by God, created by God. I mean, that's amazing. I'm convinced that the, one of the reasons that pregnant women glow, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Is because God is knitting together a human being. It's an incredible miracle. Who do you see Jesus to be? He has no limits. I said he has no limits. He raises the dead. He heals the sick. He sets the captives free. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can do it for you. He can do it for your family. There's nothing he can't do. So if you'll read the word, your faith will begin to grow. And then you'll realize, my gosh, he can do it all. But if you're distorted in your thinking, you don't read the word and you don't believe it, then you'll never even contend for that which he was crucified for and rose again from the grave. Am I making sense? So who do you see Jesus to be? I mean, you know, does anybody remember those bracelets? What would Jesus do? Well, how are you going to know what Jesus did if you don't know what he did? How would you know what he would do if you don't know what he did? There we go. Don't miss your moment. The blind man had a moment outside of Jericho. Jesus is passing by. Tonight could very well be your moment. For what? Exactly. For what? What do you want Jesus to do? Tonight could be a moment of tremendous breakthrough for you. Don't miss it. I said, I'm not. I'm here, aren't I? I think sometimes we want the Lord to give us a hand clap because we showed up to church. We're online. Good for the online people. Praise God. You live four, two miles away and you're online. Good for you. I know, you, you couldn't make it. I'm not, I'm not knocking. I'm just talking about the ones that are lazy. You're sitting there. It's not the same. You're online. I'm mean, going to understand that people are tired or whatever and different things. Please don't hear that the wrong way. But oftentimes, we can just be content with sitting at home, and we can just get content with casually cruising. Uh, I'm not going to go to EMP. I'm just going to listen, and I'm all for that. I think that's better than not listening. But you can miss him you can, I've preached sermons where I was counseling people a month before, two months before, that if they would have only been in that service, that they would have been totally free. And, and, and others were free, but they decided that day to go golfing or something, not in Alaska, obviously. They decided, well, I'm, I'm going to do something else. You never know when your moment will come. There's kairos moments. Kairos is a Greek word. I think there's five words for time. Kairos is where time and destiny meet. God could touch you tonight if you were here. As I'm preaching to people that aren't maybe even listening. He can touch you across the internet, of course. But you can miss your moment by casually just hanging out. Listen, the reason we have Sunday night, I've, I think a bunch of Sunday night services are going to start all over the valley. And I've been a little mouthy with some lately. Well, I mean, what are you doing? Oh, you've got to make another message? Grow a spine. <laughs> Sorry. That wasn't nice, Lord. Pastor Dwayne told me to say that. There's a whole way of thinking that if you, you can't have a Sunday night and God forbid you have a Wednesday because people have a life and you're going to wear them out. It's a bunch of woke, pathetic, ridiculous. It's ridiculous. If you need rest, stay home. Glory to God. 
And other people will come that couldn't even make Sunday morning because they're working or because they shouldn't work on Sunday morning. Okay, Brother Pharisee. Listen, if you, sometimes you have to work on Sunday morning. Sometimes you have to do something. And the other thing for me, I'll just tell you, when we came into the church, we were in every service. You know why? It was the freshest party in town. I'm like, oh, yeah. Let's, let's, let's say hi to our friends. Let's get touched by the Holy Ghost. Let's grow in the Word and, and rack up etern, eternal points in heaven. Come on, let's give. Let's pray. Let's see someone saved. I mean, what else would you want to do? Watch Days of the Idiots on TV? Restream the cattleman or something from like 1950 or whatever it is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can miss your moment by being casual. You can miss your moment by being lackadaisical. I got that right? And there are some who have missed their moment. And I don't want to miss mine. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, as the old phrase goes. You know why that, that phrase, the phrase of preaching to the choir? Because the choir, they're going to amen you, and they're in church. You know, you're like, Wednesday night. I mean, you come to church on Wednesday night. You're hungry. You're thirsty. You want to hear the word. You want to grow in God. I mean, otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Sunday morning can be the toughest crowd. But don't miss your moment. As God is speaking to us, the Lord is speaking to us, how desperate are you for Jesus? How desperate are you? I mean, I don't have a, a desperateometer meter to determine your desperation, but I, I do know to the degree of your hunger and the degree of your thirst will be the degree that you get impacted and touched by God. And that is not weighed by you falling on a piece of carpet anywhere. It's not measured by you falling down. That, 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 you know what it's measured by? A changed life, a, a transformed life, healing, miracles, signs tangible change in your life. I was with Dr. Morocco and uh, we were eating breakfast just last week in Tucson. And the power of God came on me and I had Dr. Morocco pray for me. And I'm gonna just tell you, I got changed. I can't tell you specifically what changed. I got altered by God. He came upon me. He touched me. And you know, the, I'm going to say this. There's such a track record with that man. We don't worship him. He's a man. And he's a good man, a godly man. But he's been my pastor for 30 years. And I have a track record with him that every time he prays for me, it always gets answered, like every time. My faith level is just, uh, he could counsel me for 30 seconds. All that, 30 seconds. I could call him and say, I have this situation what do, you, what, do you, what do you feel like the word of the Lord is? Well, Daniel, the word says this. Let's pray. Shobah, ah, bah, ah. That's actually what his tongue sounded like. And then he would pray for me, and boom. Everybody needs a pastor. Can I just tell you that? Every single person needs a pastor, needs someone in their life pouring into them, caring for them. The voice of the shepherd. And desperation releases God's power, and this man was desperate. Son of David! I mean, you, you really study this out. He, I mean, he is crying out at the top of his lungs. There's a crowd of people he's going by, but Jesus hears him. And he brings him near. Desperation for God. How desperate are you? I don't like problems. I really don't. Does anybody like problems? You're like, oh, yes, give me another one. Sign me up. I want some tribulation. I don't think any of us thinks that way. We like, you know, we like it easy. We like the, the blessing of God. But the, in the midst of the blessing, you can go through trials. And I don't like trials. Oh, but I love what they do for me. I do love what they do for me. When, I'm, when I feel cornered, when I get cornered by obstacles and problems and demonic warfare, I'm at my best because I cannot be defeated with Christ. There's nothing the enemy can do. 
can't take my life. Come on, Jesus. We just stay humble and broken and start binding and loosing and fasting and praying and believing and God shows up. I think angels show up and the devil starts running like a scalded dog and breakthrough happens. You'll never, it is an unbiblical thing to be defeated. You might lose an occasional a battle, but you don't lose the war. You win the war. And even in the, midst of, even in the midst of battles that you feel defeated in, it'll cause you, go look at the book of Judges. I mean, this perversion takes place in Benjamin and they go, I don't know, it's in Judges somewhere. And they, they go to rectify things and the Benjamites won't let go of the perverse men that did it to murder and rape this woman and they won't turn them over. The relationships that the Benjamites had meant more to them, their brotherhood meant more to them than righteousness before God. And all of Israel comes up and they go and they fight them and they lose the first time. How, I kind of like, how do they lose? Like, wow, Lord, do we, do we go again? They inquire, the Lord's like, go. They go and they lose again. I think they lose 22,000 men. What the heck? We're on the side of the Lord. How is it that we're losing? They come back, they fast, they pray, they inquire, and the Lord says, go. And they go and they defeat Benjamin. Why didn't they defeat him on the first time? Because when there's an endorsement of evil, listen closely to what I'm telling you right now. When there's an endorsement of evil, there releases a greater power of evil. And, and there is times where you just need an extra touch from God and you need to break through in the spirit before you see the manifested victory in the natural. And so just because you're fighting a battle and it's like, well, I lost, get up! Cry out some more! Buck up! Lace up your gloves and get back in there. If it's the will of God, if it's the will of the Lord, don't shrink back, don't quit, don't let up. Son of David, son of David, son of David. That was my prayer language. It doesn't need to be interpreted. Lift your hands to heaven. Hallelujah. Don't ever quit. Quitting is a four-letter curse word I've taught my children. You will never hear me say, I quit. I've felt that way before, but feelings are deceptive. D, let us follow Jesus. Share our testimony so others will follow him too. That's what this man does. He, keys, please. He is following Jesus. People see it. People see the miracle. Do you know that people will see because of your desperation, because you contended, because you believed, you'll walk in miracle power. And as you walk in miracle power, your family's going to see you. They're going to see how it happened. They're gonna, they know you. They'll see the change in you. They'll see the change in your family. Your wife will see you. Your husband will see you. Your teacher will see you. Your peers will see you was talking to a young man who was headed for destruction. In February, God visited him. And he gave his life to Christ. And then he went back and started telling all his friends that he gave his life to Jesus. His friends didn't believe him at first, but they noticed that he's no longer cursing. They noticed he doesn't want to drink and drug anymore. They noticed he's different and he has joy and he's going to church and he's talking about Jesus and they noticed that he was blind, but now he sees. And because of that influence of that young man and the transformation that took place, his friends are coming into the church, left and right, left and right, left and right. They're like, I want to see what you, what is this? What is this thing? Jesus is passing this way. Come on, he's passing this way. What do you want him to do for you tonight? I hope you enjoyed the broadcast and it's enriched you and helped you in your life. If you've never made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you do it now? Pray this prayer with me right out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place. Thank you that he rose again from the grave for me. Forgive me of all of my sin. Wash me, cleanse me, and make me new. Thank you for loving me, and thank you for hearing my prayer. 
Amen. Let me pray for you. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would touch each and every person that prayed that prayer out of sincerity of heart. I pray a breaking off of every assignment of darkness, any chain, any bondage, any habit that's not of God, that you would sever it and set them free. I pray and ask, Holy Spirit, touch them and fill them now and use them for your purpose and give them a hunger for your word and for the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, text us, would you, so that we can help you grow in the things of God. Text SAVED to the number 907-357-2065. If you don't have a home church, we hope that you would find a home with us here at Kings, Alaska. If you're in some other part of the nation or the world, find a good local church that preaches and teaches God's word and grow in the things of God. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you in future broadcasts or in services. Praise the Lord.